Hello, everyone. This is by far the most relaxing setup for a presenter that I've ever experienced. Um, I feel like I should be standing, but I'll try to sit up straight and pretend. Uh, so I'll be talking about moving uh, twisted code to async I.O., which is something that is now available in, in Python 3 uh, that allows asynchronous um, code execution. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about what that means um, here in a bit. But first, to, to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about, first is just sort of what do I mean by async. Uh, some twisted examples, followed by some async I.O. examples, uh, then moving from twisted to async I.O. And if I have time, I'll talk about the effective use of emoji in presentations when all you've ever used is LaTeX. Uh, I've never had emojis available to me. I'm, I'm using a tool called MARP that just came out where you can write a markdown and then it shows up in real time in like a little viewer, which is pretty cool. Uh, so I've never had emojis, so I might go a little crazy. Uh, time for a quick poll. How many people have downloaded, I don't know, we'll call it stuff, from BitTorrent? <laughs> Show of hands. Great, honest people. Uh, how many people have purchased drugs on Silk Road? Uh, okay, one. Okay, you're, you're lying, I know it. There's gotta be more than that. All right, what about drugs on Open Bazaar? No, nobody? You should try it, uh, Silk Road guy. You should try it. Uh, all right, so, so what are all these public, we'll call them public services, what do they have in common? Um, well, they all use DHTs. A distributed hash table, or DHT, is a system that provides a lookup service similar to a hash table. We have a key and a value pair uh, that are stored in a distributed fashion across many nodes, and any participating node can effectively retrieve the value associated with any given key. So if you have um, you know, a key and a value that you want to store, uh, you can pick a node and store it, Here's an image of a distributed hash, oh, sorry, that's the wrong image. Uh, nope, that's the right one, there we go. Uh, so you have uh, data that comes in, so you have a, um, say a key that is hashed, that hash then tells you which nodes to store the data on, and then you can retrieve that data based on the hash of the key in the future. So the idea is that this is, this is a case where nodes are gonna be coming up and they're gonna go down a lot, so you need, um, Lots of redundancy across the entire network. You also need the ability to republish values over time. Um, this is all handled by various types of distributed hash table um, algorithms, and it's all used in the, the public services that I mentioned earlier, where you have lots of nodes that are coming up and down. There's no centralized repository for, for keys and values. So why are we talking about DHTs? Well, um, first of all, network heavy code can really benefit from being asynchronous. And in a little bit, I'll talk about what that means and how you can use it. Uh, but especially because it relies on UDP. And most of the uh, examples that I gave earlier all rely on UDP uh, for the distributed hash table. And that's uh, just because um, it's a lot less expensive in terms of network overhead. So you can send a message, and then it's, you may or may not get a response. The node may or may not be down. But you don't have to deal with an error case where you can't actually establish a TCP connection. Uh, so this is a, a stateless protocol. Um, but that means that there's a lot more uh, actual like uh, connection management. So you send a message, you wait a little bit, you see whether or not you get a response back. Uh, that can be fairly expensive, uh, especially when you're trying to contact hundreds, potentially thousands of different nodes on a network. Um, there are more networking things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in a uh, WWW-centered philosophy. So like we talk a lot about you know, when we talk about networking in these types of conferences, it's typically your you know it's web. You're talking about HTTP or you're talking about contacting a database. Um, I think it's important to remember that there's lots of things that use different types of networking, and DHTs are one example that use a very special case uh, with UDP. Um, and then finally, I wrote a DHT library named Kademlia that, that could be ported from Python 2 and twisted to Python 3 and async IO. So I figured that that could be a good talk. I actually proposed the talk before I even like, knew anything about async IO, uh, which was dangerous, but it ended up working out in the end because it was pretty easy. So let's talk about async. Uh, here's an example problem. So this is using the uh, simple HTTP request handler that exists in the uh, stock HTTP server library that comes with Python 3. Um, if we have a path at slash slow, so this is if somebody goes to your server slash slow um, in a web browser, then you know, say we've got some slow DB query that's going to take a little while to run, uh, and somebody else wants to just load the main page. 
Um, so if that slow DB query takes a really, really, really long time um, to run, and you have one person hitting slow, somebody else just wants to view the main page. Um, so not slash slow, so we're just gonna send them higher. Um, does anybody know what'll happen for the person who just wants the fast, like, give me the main page? It will be blocked by this little query, yeah. So, so this is the problem here, is that we, if we have a thing that might take a little bit of time, um, and somebody else wants something that's very fast, we have to wait. We have to block until the slow thing finishes before we can then handle the, the fast thing for everybody else. So what are our options? Well, there's really three. Um, we could either have the synchronous responses where we deal with one request at a time. Um, this is easy for you, but it's not so great for your users. So for the person who just wants to see the, the homepage, um, that will load very quickly and say hi there, they're gonna be waiting for somebody else who wants uh, another page that's very slow. That's not really a great option. The second one is, um, is we could just fork a new process. So this one is really easy for you, the programmer, but it's expensive for the computer. So spinning up a whole, whole new process is something that um, has a, a high expense for the kernel. Um, then the third option is that you could start a new thread for each request. So say you have one socket per thread. Uh, that one is a lot harder for you, the programmer, because of the global interpreter lock, you have to you know, do, um, make sure that uh, memory isn't, isn't being accessed by more than one thread at one time. Um, in terms of writes especially, but reads can also be tricky, and it's also very expensive for the computer. Not as, not as, a, as expensive as the uh, multiprocessing, but um, when you have to spin up multiple threads, uh, especially one per socket, then that can be very expensive for the kernel as well. So these are like three not so great options. Um, the fourth option is an event-driven approach. So we could use an IO multiplexing library like ePoll uh, that solve the problem with a single threaded concurrent code. This is known as asynchronous socket approach or a select based multiplexing. The basic idea is this, while one socket is waiting for data, do something else. Uh, like we could read or write on another socket, for instance. Um, and this is done by the kernel essentially either sending signals or telling us when there's data that's available on one of the sockets. So we can just essentially pull all of the available sockets. Um, and this is known as concurrency. It's all in one thread and one process. And that's, this is one, one part that I think really trips folks up, is that um, they think it's either multi-threading or multi-processing. It's neither. It is a single thread and a single process, um, which is concurrency, uh, which is the composition of independently executing processes. So progress can be made on more than one task at a time. This is not parallelism where things are being executed simultaneously. Um, that's, that's something different. So this is concurrency. Now, to give you an example, uh, we can look at my hometown Waffle House. Uh, that is uh, Stephen Colbert, who is from my hometown of Charleston, South Carolina. And that is the Waffle House where we both hung out at, uh, not together at different times, but um, <laughs> uh, single-threaded concurrency looks like this. So you've got a line, a line cook who's preparing lots of food. Uh, there's lots of plates in front of them. He's got, you know, some, you know, some stacked, capped, smothered, covered, you know, goodness on one plate and something else on something else. And he's, he's making progress on each of those. But there's only one guy. And he's only able to work on one plate at any given time. Now, he might be able to cook some eggs over here, and then he can split those up and put them on two plates. But the idea is that he's working on each task concurrently, because there's lots of plates that have progress that are being made, at the same time, but he's not executing uh, more than one plate at a given time. So we're making progress in all these as we can, as the hash browns are ready, as the eggs are ready, then they can be placed on the appropriate plate. But we're not doing all the plates at the exact same time. That would require more than one person that would be multi-threading, that would be multi-processing. Does that make sense? Uh, so here's an example of what this looks like in terms of memory usage. Um, we have the Apache a multi-processing module uh, that's in blue, and then we have Nginx, which uses ePoll that's in this sort of like baby shit brown color at the bottom. Uh, and we see that the memory usage for Apache is like, uh, goes up quite a bit as we start talking about concurrent processes. This is because it has to spin up a whole new process for each new connection. This is incredibly expensive, and this is why um, Nginx or Apache with a, with a uh, even a multi-threading uh, module would be uh, far more superior in terms of memory usage. So let's talk about how to async. Um, the, I think one of the best examples in Python, at least uh, historically, has been twisted. 
Uh, Twisted is an event-driven networking engine. It makes it easy to implement custom concurrent network applications in Python. It lets you do lots of cool stuff. So non-blocking network I.O. So this is uh, the, the concurrent code that we're talking about. Uh, Twisted implements many protocols. So this is SSH, SSTP, IMAP, DNS, XMPP, FTP, Finger, AMP, GPS. They have GPS protocols. HTTP, IRC, Memcache, and NTP, Shotcast, Telnet. Talk, does anybody know what the, the talk protocol is? So this is like the old school AIM uh, chat protocol. <laughs> That's implemented in Twisted. Um, so it lets you create projects that utilize many of these protocols at once. So it is ridiculously easy if you want to say like, spin up a DNS server that then alerts you via AOL AIM about every request. And then also, and then also like sends an email that you can SSH into uh, and provides like, like you're SSHing into your actual running application where you can run code, um, then Twisted can do that, which is pretty cool. Um, it's also some of the nicest looking Python out there. Uh, so here's an example. This is a simple um, echo server where we um, define a protocol. So this essentially is, um, handles like, what do we do when we receive data? And in this case, we just return it, we just write it back, and then we have a factory that will build this protocol for every single connection that we get. And then we can start um, a reactor. Uh, and this will, for every, every new, um, say telnet's the best way to play with this, you just telnet the right port to the local host, and then you just type some stuff and hit enter, and then it'll print it back out at you. Um, so it's, it's not that much code at all, and then this is something that will scale rather dramatically. So what if we add a slow thing? Um, so this is the same, same example, except that now we have a slow database query. Uh, and let's say that that's something that'll you know, take who knows how long, but we don't want it to um, slow up anybody else who wants to take advantage of our echo server uh, and its awesome functionality. So what we can do is we can, this will create what's called a deferred, it's also known as a future in async IO, um, and we can give it a callback. In this case, a send response that will get whatever the result of our query was, and then we just write that out to the transport. Um, so this is a case where, it's not real, probably not an echo in this case, because you're like taking the input data, and then you're running some query, and then you're spitting something else out, and um, you're doing that based on this callback. So while the slow database query is running on one hand, you can be doing lots of other stuff. You can be accepting other connections, starting other database queries, um, which uh, is pretty cool. But you know, of course, ew, callbacks. What is this note? Actually, there's a no talk over mm -hmm. in the other like open conference area uh, where they're probably looking at lots of callbacks right now. Um, <laughs> so, so the great thing uh, in Twisted is that they they added a um, they added the ability to to wrap a function um, using a decorator called in, inline callbacks that will allow you to yield um, a, a the deferred. So this is the thing that might take a little while. Um, and then we don't have to use callbacks, um, but it does um, add this add this requirement that we add a decorator. Um, and there's one like peculiarity here that doesn't exist in async IO, which is that we can't actually return. So this function becomes a generator where we're yielding. Uh, there could be lots and lots of yields in there where we're yielding as we can, um, but we can't actually return anything. So. Sorry, so if you just slide. Mm -hmm. so Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So slow database query does does still return uh, does still um, return a, a promise or in this case a deferred for twisted, um, it, but we can yield that and so the wrapper will take care of um, of uh, then a yielding control. So it's a um, it's essentially so we, we're basically turning this into a generator that can yield control. Um, and then we can like continue our reactor loop where the reactor is like looking at all the, all the deferreds that exist and it's like, okay, this thing is not like, progress is not being made, let's move on to the next one and then eventually gets back to it. Um, and this, this is like pretty much copied in async IO except with some better syntax. Uh, but this is, this is like exactly what async IO does but with I think some cleaner syntax. And we'll, I'll show you that and maybe it'll make more sense then. Any other questions on Twisted? All right, how to async with async.io. 
Uh, so first, it's worth noting that the async I/O package has been included in the standard library on a provisional basis, which means that they could just remove it or completely change the API at will and nobody can complain. So you should know that. So a little history, Python 3.3 added the yield from, which allowed a generator to delegate part of its operations to another generator. So it allowed you within one generator to basically say, actually like um, delegate all the next generation to this other generator with um, a better syntax with yield from, as opposed to having to actually loop through that and then yield out of another generator. This, this is just like some syntactic sugar. Um, also added support for async IO, which at the time and before that was known as Tulip. Uh, then Python 3.4 added async IO to the actual core, and then with 3.5, we got um, some more sugar syntactically with await and async. Uh, and I'll show you what those, those do in a second. Uh, what if you still use Python 2? Um, how many people are stuck on Python 2? Yep. Uh, all right, well, there's Trillius, but not really. Uh, so we just said stop using it. Um, so there's, there's it like just prints out a warning that says you shouldn't use it. Um, so use at your own risk. So in the async IO innards, we've got a, a pluggable event loop, uh, just like Twisted with the reactor. We have uh, transport and protocol abstractions, which were pretty much just taken straight from Twisted. Actually, the, the, um, the definition for those, they're essentially interfaces, these abstractions for transports and protocols. The, uh, the actual definition for the methods is almost the exact same, except that Twisted used uh, camel case and then async IO uses like you know, the uh, underscore uh, between the, the different words. And that's like, that's pretty much the only difference. <laughs> um, so um, async IO has support for TCP, UDP, and SSL, as well as subprocess pipes, delete calls, um, but does not include any actual um, protocol um, abstractions, uh, or actual implementations, rather, uh, within it, like Twisted with all the SSH and SMTP and all the rest. Um, it also provides an interface for passing work off to a thread pool for times where you absolutely positively have to use a library that makes blocking IO calls. All those things are the exact same in Twisted, um, for the most part, except with different, uh, different actual interfaces. So the event loop runs uh, in a single thread and executes all the callbacks and tasks um, in the same thread. While the task is running in the event loop, no other task is running in the same thread. When the task uses the yield from, uh, then the task is suspended and the event loop is able to move on to the next task and execute that. Any questions on that bit? All right, so this is done using coroutines. Coroutines are computer program components that generalize subroutines for non-preemptive multitasking by allowing multiple entry points for suspending and resuming execution at certain locations. This is a really complicated way of um, describing something that we already do. Um, and to give you an example, in the olden times, um, if we needed a range, what we could do is we give them some value that we, we want to go up to, and then we just sort of iterate, and while some index that we keep track of is less than that, then we just append that to an array that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, um, and then return it. Um, that's how we used to do ranges in the olden times. Nowadays, in the modern times, uh, we can create a generator, and so we can actually yield these values. We don't need to keep all the past values on hand and then return them all at once. Instead, we can simply yield control back up to whoever is calling us and give them the value so far. Um, this generator is a coroutine. So this is a great example of um, what a coroutine is, where we can, um, we can yield control back up to whoever is calling us. Uh, when they get a value, then um, then they can continue execution. So here's an async IO example. Uh, in this case, we are using the async um, def as opposed to regular def. Uh, if you're, this is available in Python 3.5. Prior to that, there's a decorator that you can use, uh, and then the syntax for await is a yield from instead of an await. Um, but that's, that's the only difference. So when we put an async def instead of a regular def, we're essentially saying this thing is a coroutine, which means this is a thing that will act as a generator, a thing that we will yield control from. Um, and that's what happens on the second actual line of code inside of the compute function where we await async IO sleep. So what's happening here is await is the same as a yield from if we were to use the, the decorator instead for a coroutine. Uh, the two are synonymous. So we're saying we're going we're gonna to yield from, we're going to essentially say like, the, we're going to use the, this generator will be yielding values for us. And we're generator two, we're going to essentially just be yielding from this, this other generator. I think I have sleep, 
is very different from time.sleep. Time.sleep actually suspends the execution of the current thread. Async, async IO sleep just says like, um, eh, like I'll yield from this thing when this amount of time has finished and this is something that um, is based on the internal react reactor loop that it keeps its own internal time clock. So what happens when you actually call one of these uh, async defs, this generator coroutine, um, is that it immediately returns. Uh, this is something that you immediately get a result from. So when we, the second line from the bottom where we say run until complete with the print sum, we immediately get a response from that and then the loop actually starts the uh, running of the generator, iterating through what it gets back. Um, so in this case, um, we print sum, print sum will await a compute, the compute actually just sleeps for a bit and then returns the sum. Um, the execution is, uh, this is an example taken from the async IO doc, so mm -hmm. forgive the like kind of crappy sequence diagram here. Um, but what's happening is that we like, where the, the generators are yielding from this other generator that's yielding, it eventually gets down to the await sleep and then um, the reactor loop that's running is like, okay, like there's, um, there's nothing I can do until that, that finally yields, so I'll go do something else. One second later, um, it actually gets a result back and then it can um, raise the stop iteration for the generator all the way down and then the whole loop is stopped. Any questions on that example? Conversion time. Uh, how many people are considering or planning to move Twisted Code to Async IO? Awesome. What are the rest of you doing in here? Um, <laughs> how many people are considering or planning to move Synchronous Code to Async IO? Okay, great. Um, so let's talk about reasons you'd want to do that. Um, why convert Synchronous Python to Async IO? Well, if you have lots of IO and you want to go fast, um, so this includes anything like Database reads writes over a network or a socket, um, any sort of networking call, so whether that's DNS lookups, HTTP client or server side. Um, this unfortunately does not include file system IO uh, for some rather boring technical reasons. Um, that's not something that, that can be done with um, the reactor loops and the libraries that are used for the multiplexing. Um, also if you're cool, because uh, async is fun. So there's some reasons you shouldn't do it. Um, so if the Python 2 to 3 conversion is too burdensome, uh, in which case you should probably just check out Twisted and um, understand that you'll have to rewrite your code if you ever do end up converting. Uh, or if you don't have any IO, um, or scaling isn't really a goal. This includes, and probably, the case of like, I have tons of calculations that take forever. Um, this is not gonna make those go fast. What this does is it allows you for especially for networking IO, or if you have, um, if you want to actually run synchronous code in a thread pool, like this is a library that will help you do that, but it will not, um, it will not make slow things, all slow things go fast. It makes, it allows you to execute code while sockets are taking time, uh, but it will not make slow things go fast. So why convert Twisted to Async I.O. for the handful of folks in here who are thinking about that? Well, one is that you get to remove a dependency uh, and then you gain core support. Um, and then also I think the code is prettier and smaller with Async and Await. I think that um, does definitely add quite a bit of help to maintainability. Now there are some reasons why you probably shouldn't do that. Um, if you can't convert from Python 2 to 3 or if you use a transporter protocol that isn't supported by a library. So like if you wanted to write an AOL um, AIM uh, talk client, then you probably will have to implement it yourself uh, instead of using Twisted. And then also you may end up adding many dependencies. So if you're doing lots of different networking things like uh, SMTP and some DNS and something else, then you're gonna have to add a separate library for each one of those. So there are libraries that exist there as third party libraries for each one of those protocols. Uh, but that means that you're gonna have to, instead of just Twisted, you're gonna have to now use lots of libraries. Why did I convert Kademlia, uh, the, the distributed hash table that I wrote? Well, I wanted to convert to Python 3 anyway. It only relied on Twisted and another library I wrote called RPC UDP, which is a library that provides a statefulish connection for RPC, so remote procedure calls. You can um, run a remote procedure on another computer uh, using UDP as opposed to TCP. So the amount of network traffic is much, much lower, um, but your latency is much, much higher, um, which is uh, great if you don't know if another machine is up and if you have to talk to lots of them at once, like the distributed hash table. 
And then uh, I, I knew that I could migrate RPC UDP to async IO and then just remove all of its dependencies so it, it would no longer require Twisted and um, did my actual Kademlia library only relied on, on that RPC UDP to actually talk to all the other uh, nodes. So the process I took, well, I used the um, two to three conversion file by file and it turned out that everything actually was already Python 3 compatible except for some like lots of fun with bytes um, when it came down to the actual UDP um, data exchange. Um, I replaced some callbacks with the weights and, and defs with the async defs and then turned on some awesome logging options in async IO and then uh, tested. So what happened was code that looked like this. So this is twisted code. Um, and maybe this is just my own like crappy coding style, but I, I always end up with these like defs inside of defs. Um, and then I use those as callbacks, um, which is not pretty. And they could totally be like methods. In this case, this is a bootstrap method that's used to, um, you, you can bootstrap a, a node on the DHT by giving it lots of nodes of uh, other, um, give it other nodes that you know about, and then it will contact all of them and ask them about their friends, and they'll tell you about their friends, and they'll tell you about their friends, and then you can sort of bootstrap your knowledge of the entire network. Um, and in this case, uh, I had you know to, to ping all of them, and then I get some results back, and then I can actually start crawling them. Um, and so I had this, uh, this internal def that I created. Like, this looks ugly, and it's not great. And it could have been done with, a, um, with an inline callback, and then maybe another method, but Deaths inside of defs are just kind of gross looking. Uh, so this is the async IO conversion. And you'll notice like it's less code, it's prettier, there's no internal def. Um, and I can just say the whole thing is whole thing is async, and then um, I can ping all the addresses I know about, and then I get back some results, and then I can crawl all of those afterwards. So you'll notice that I'm using the async IO gather in this case, which basically says take all of these things that are gonna wait, uh, that are gonna take a while to do, and then tell me when they're all done and give me all their results. Um, so it's, I think it looks prettier, less code. And that was sort of what, what most of the conversion ended up looking like. So some lessons. Async IO resulted in, in cleaner code and less code. Um, unfortunately, there's no unit test support for async or await, which means another dependency has to be added. So there are libraries out there that you can use to help you test async and, and await um, code. There's no looping call concept, which is something I use in a few places from Twisted. So this is where you say like, uh, do this thing every 10 minutes, or do this thing every five minutes, and then it'll just, um, the reactor loop will take care of executing that thing every you know, period of time. Uh, this was actually implemented and then entirely removed uh, from async IO, which uh, they have this long, long rambling explanation for why, but I found that to be a pain in the ass. Um, asynchronous context managers like async with are awesome. This allows you to do things like um, uh, transactions for databases, and um, those look really pretty compared to uh, what previously had to be done. And then async has fantastic error detection with event loop logging. So I have some examples, like the top one, there's this case where I've got an, a, a coroutine where I just print hello, um, and uh, when you call ensure future, what happens is it actually adds it to the, adds the, the coroutine, to the scheduler. So you have to schedule any code routine that you create that basically says, hey, reactor, run this thing whenever you get a chance. Um, but I never actually start the loop. So you have to say like loop dot run forever or loop dot run until complete and give it, give it a code routine. In this case, I never even started the loop. <clears throat> and uh, Python 3 detects that. It's like, hey, you never started the loop. There was this task you made, but it's still pending, which is super useful. That doesn't exist in Twisted. Um, and then also like here's a case where I have uh, hello world. Now again, coroutines return immediately. So in this case, I call hello world, returns immediately, um, and um, doesn't actually execute the code that's that's in that's defined within because this is the async is like the the decorator that's a coroutine, and so it's like code. Well, it looks like I'm calling it hello world. I'm calling it. Um, what's happening is it's returning immediately, not executing that code because that's something that the scheduler will do. Uh, but the scheduler is never actually given that code to run. So then that's a problem. We never actually awaited that thing to, to actually run. We never gave it to the scheduler to run the loop, never ran it. So that's pretty cool. Like that didn't exist in Twisted. Uh, so this sort of error, there's lots, of, lots more debugging that I had to do when writing Twisted code. Um, so that's cool. So some final thoughts. Async IO is definitely not as mature as Twisted. There are undocumented unit, taste, unit test utils rather in the Async IO source that I discovered today. Um, 
that are replicated by a few libraries. So there's like not a right way to do testing with async IO. Um, and then Twisted has many more implemented protocols. So um, you have to like, there's lots of libraries that implement uh, say SMTP or HTTP differently for async IO and it's sort of hard to find like the most mature one or the best one so far. Um, and then uh, there's, I think it's important to note that despite its provisional status, there are, there are a lot of these libraries that exist for async IO. Um, it's just you're sort of in the, like, the early days of Node where it's like, well, what's the best library for connecting to Postgres? There's 3,000 of them and they're all crappy and not well maintained. Um, not quite that bad, but um, there's not like a single library like Twisted to say like, this is how we're gonna implement this thing and then everybody focus on this one thing. Um, and then finally, I found that the async IO code was cleaner and smaller. And I think that that's a, that's a huge reason why it's gonna be my de facto choice going forward. Any questions? These, by the way, are the, the repos, and then under the Python 3.5 uh, branch, is, you'll find all the Python 3.5. Yeah, so when you try to run this code, uh, Python will just immediately print out the wow. exception, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so um, uh, I think it was like a year or two ago, Glyph from Twisted wrote a long log, uh, blog post about how um, Twisted wasn't going anywhere and it was still gonna be around. And uh, they can, like, you can basically take the Twisted event loop and um, use that under async IO or vice versa, which is pretty cool. The number of protocols that are implemented in Twisted is great. I think that there's some talk about converting those to async IO, but like the syntactic sugar that's added, I think gives you a lot more power that you won't be able to do with Twisted unless they convert all that stuff. And so like they're focused on converting the Python 3 support just in general um, across the entire code base. Um, and to get to like Python 3.5 support with the additional stuff would require lots of rewriting. I like honestly, my thoughts are um, it's probably better unless like one of the cases why you should or should not convert from one to the other is, is satisfied. I think it's just better to, um, to, to use async IO in most cases, unless you have to use twisted. Um, so you can, um, you'll get an error if you just simply try to call one of those functions without eventually awaiting it. Now you could call that and then like assign that to a variable and then later on await that variable um, because it's just a generator. So you can take that generator and you can, you know, send it via a parameter and a function or do something else with it. Um, but if you never actually await it either in another coroutine or schedule it via the actual loop itself, then you'll get an exception. So it'll be very obvious if you've done something wrong. Yep. Yes? Can you define AC functions as uh, function partials? So you can create sort of generalized functions that you can say, okay, I want you to take this function and then async it and then you draw mm -hmm. a wrapper around that for just different ways? Yes, and you can do that using the coroutine decorator. And, oh, okay. and so like just by calling that function around like whatever you put together, um, will work the exact same as this. Yes. Have you used uh, async IO with multiple processing? Uh, I have not. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, like it would have to be a very special case, I think, because like at that point, I might as well just like um, execute all the processes individually through some other. Like there are, there are certain constraints, I, I haven't used it, but I know that like your arguments, if you wanna be able to get anything back, everything has to be serializable via pickle, pickling. So you have to be able to pickle all the arguments and then you can un have to be able to unpickle them um, in terms of the result of running that. So I, it sounds, I don't know, it has to be a very special case to, to do that. Yes? No, and I, I um, I have an aversion to G events in general. 
um, because it's um, mostly with memory management. So I like none of this. None of this code is none of the async I/O code is thread safe, um, and I don't like the restrictions in the event of often having to worry about that type of thing um, because you may have code that is run in a separate thread. And um, the magic there worries me. Uh, another question is, in the beginning of your slides, you showed an example returning a promise in twisted code. Mm -hmm. Having an event loop waiting on both I.O. kind of, not an I.O. event and this promise. So does like, the promise managed by Yes, so um, so I know that there has been some some work in the past to make the features that exist within async IO and then the deferreds and twisted to make them interoperable. Uh, and I think that project, well, the, the few projects I saw were abandoned. I don't know if um, I don't know if there's been much uh, effort in the last year or so on that type of thing. Uh, but they are like conceptually roughly the same. Um, just definitely not interoperable because the, the loops are expecting different things. Any other questions? Yes. What's your favorite async testing framework right now? Oh my goodness. Uh, there's like eight async tests, I think, is, is one of the, it seems to be one of the preeminent ones um, that I play with a little. I just, like, I, I, like literally two hours ago, discovered that there are. <laughs> Uh, test helpers that exist in um, the async IO module in Python, and I was going to play with those and see if there was enough of what I needed there. Um, do you have a favorite? Do you have you? I use those too. I feel like they should be spun out to be able to the game is not quite come yet when they're ready to be spun out. Mm -hmm. It's really good stuff where they're like you can knock the clock so you can Yeah, yeah. That's all right. Yeah, and that's that is something that I will say is really strong inside of Twisted. Like they have their own testing utility called Trial, and then they simply extend uh, test case for unit tests for all of these, um, for all the the actual test classes, and then you can do all kinds of fun stuff uh, when it comes to that. And they've made it they don't like document it very well, but the code is clean enough that you can just read the code and figure out how it works. And that is like solid. And I wish that that existed in async I/O. Uh, I don't. I don't think that there's anything that can be done. So it's a. It's an actual constraint of um, of the underlying um, libraries that are like um, the uh, epoll library, for instance, will not allow you on Linux or OS X uh, to um, handle a file selector in the same way, the file descriptor in the same way. Um, and so the way that the signals are basically bubbled up to say like, oh, this is a thing that's now ready, um, is not not supported by ePoll. And so that's something that isn't supported inside. And there's actually like um, a bunch of uh, text explaining this inside of the async IO module as to why they can't can't support it. And it's because of the underlying library. That said, I have no idea how Node does it because Node does have um, file I.O. that is asynchronous, supposedly, uh, but I, I don't know how they're doing it. Though. Okay. Yeah. That, that could be it then. Yep. So, uh, essentially, I mean, I is essentially a single thread, right? Mm hmm Yep. Um, so, in a multi-core um, environment, those are, I guess we don't really get any benefit. Yeah, and like I said, it, Yep, or, or you can you can use multi-threading. Um, so there is there's the ability to, uh, in, in Twisted is called deferred thread, or they have like a thread pool inside of async IO where you can basically say like take this synchronous thing and go run it in some other thread, and then when it finishes, like give me the result. Um, so you can use that or the multi-processing uh, part of async IO to run uh, separate processes as well. Um, it just it it could potentially get, like if you have a case where you can embarrassingly parallelize your 
code that you're trying to run, then that's easy enough. If you have a case where what you actually need is multiple threads or to be able to mutate the same memory location, um, then that can get really tricky and you should probably use something a more fun language uh, like Clojure. Uh, are there any common frameworks that are probably the I don't know for sure. I think um, that, I know that Django had some sort of module that allowed you to use the twisted event loop to yeah. respond. Um, I th and I wouldn't be surprised if they also had an async IO method for running the WSGI stuff too. Um, I don't know of any others that have, I don't know what Tornado is doing, I haven't looked at that in a while, but. Any other questions? Alrighty, thank you all very much. <laughs>